Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Kelly Andreessen. Thank you all for being here at the uh, Johnson County Emergency Communication Center today. Um, today is March 17th, 2020. Uh, my name is Kelly Andreessen. I'm the Public Information Officer for Johnson County. Uh, just wanted to lay out a few ground rules before we start. Um, as in the past, we have sign language interpret interpreters here. Um, if you are shooting video, please make sure that you include them in the shot. Uh, we are doing a Facebook Live on the Johnson County Public Health Facebook page. So we do have a microphone. Jack here has a microphone. Um, so if you do have a question, please raise your hand. He'll get the microphone to you, state your name, your affiliation, and then ask your question. Uh, we do have a few representatives from different organizations around here, and in the interest of social distan distancing, we'll be bringing them in one at a time to give their prepared statement. And then following those statements, if you have any questions for that individual, uh, we'll open it up for you to ask those questions at that time. And then they will also be available individually after the press conference has wrapped um, for you to ask any maybe follow-up or further questions if, if you have them. Um, and please, if, if you have um, any need to get somebody and they're no longer available, just get in touch with me and I can get you connected to them. Um, but at that time, at this time, I will uh, bring in Dave Wilson, our Director of Johnson County Emergency Management for some statements. Welcome everybody to the Johnson County Emergency Operations Center and the uh, press conference. This will be our last press conference. That's a joint one um, from this point on based on the orders that have been issued related to the public health emergency. We're going to go back to doing press releases as Kelly might have talked about and uh, more one-on-one -on -one interviews. Uh, we are, for those folks that are not here in the room, we are practicing social distancing and we do not have more than 10 in the room, full disclosure. Um, Kelly, I think, talked to you about the ground rules. So as you can understand, it's been a challenging and uh, ever-changing, very dynamic, very fluid situation, uh, just like we knew it would be when this finally came to the shores. So what I would say is our message continues to be that of we're just changing our business model. Government's not closed. We're changing the way we deliver essential and critical services. So we're trying to move more to service delivery of online services, utilize the online services as much as possible. Uh, we're kind of pivoting on how we do those deliveries of services. And uh, to that end, county government uh, has some announcements that Kelly put out today on how we're delivering those services. Um, for us in the emergency management world, it, it affects us too. So our emergency operations center is moving to more of a virtual platform we're not having more than 10 key folks in our room that normally sit 66. We're doing more of our uh, meetings with remote visitation of people online. So when we continue uh, uh, the emergency operations, we're pivoting our business model as well, being more of a virtual emergency operations center. The 10 most key people are getting together, we're practicing social distancing, and we're doing things virtually. So if we can do it to manage an emergency, I think it's reasonable that all Johnson County residents uh, be rational and cooperative with how we, you know, get our meals. Most places are just going to uh, either drive up windows or drop off services. Delivery services are becoming very big and very popular. Uh, but just pivot the way and rethink the way you get your services. Uh, right now, the country at large, in Johnson County especially, needs problem solvers. What we don't need and what's not productive and not helpful is people running around acting like chickens with their heads cut off. The sun will come up tomorrow. The majority of people do survive this. It is highly lethal to a segment of the population, and Dave Coach will talk about that in his public health piece. But it is not the end all. People need to show some social responsibility. So if you've got folks that work in critical jobs, critical continuity of government jobs, those people have to be able to report to work, whether they're at the hospital or public safety, fire, EMS, police, jail, all those core functions that we need to keep the lights on, the water running, 
the fuel in the cylinders. If your neighbor is at home because they're otherwise displaced from their routine job, boy, wouldn't it be great socially if we reached out to them and said, can I help you out with a, day a daycare issue? The last thing we want is a nurse or somebody that's not able to come to work because they simply don't have something to do with their kids. Their kids don't have a place to go, so the nurse can't report to work. The kids don't have a place to go, so dad can't report to the jail or to patrol to answer the 911 calls. Uh, the kids don't have a place to go, so the 911 operator can't come to answer the phone. Meanwhile, if we could just reach out to those people that we know, those people are our neighbors, and say, what can I do to help you out so you can help me out in the long run? I think that would be amazing. And that's what we do as Iowans, Johnson County residents, and Americans. So I'll get off my soapbox about that. I apologize. But that is a challenge that we face. How do we keep the core people that have to do their job coming to work? And that's something we're thinking about. The other thing we're thinking about is, you know, there's a huge shortage right now of personal protective equipment, N95s, and other things we need to do those core functions. If you're turning off your business for whatever reason, and you've got personal protective equipment that's otherwise sitting there collecting dust and not being used, if you could reach out to those places that are still open, that still might need that, whether it's through the Emergency Operations Center in your county to make a donation to them, or if you're part of a larger healthcare industry or whatever, if you could reallocate and repurpose that material so those N95 masks, those gloves, those cleaning supplies are readily available for those on the front line doing patient care and dealing with this, that would be great. It would be a real shame if you came back to work at your place of business and you've got all this stuff stocked up in your business, but meanwhile, those core services struggled to get masks, gowns, gloves, things like that. So we're all in this together. If we could all be problem solvers, that would be incredible. And we will get through this. It is not the end of the world. We will get through this, but we really need to work together. So saying that, um, we're going to get ready to turn it over to the next person, and I'll get off my soapbox. I appreciate you bearing with me. If anybody has any questions for me, I'm going to repeat those questions uh, for the audience at large, and then I'm going to step out of the room and turn it over to the next person. So go ahead. Okay. I just kind of wanted to rehash what you were talking about with the, the neighbors and the neighbor uh, you know, friendliness and asking for help, especially with people with occupations of yeah. being nurses or responses. Kind of where, where do you find a line of obviously there's people, you know, fearful for their, their children. Sure. Their children are, sure. you know, part of that higher risk. Uh, yeah. And if you've got uh, family members that for whatever reason meet that demographic and you're in that high risk population, I get it. You know, if you're somebody that's immunocompromised, at whatever age, or if you're in one of the age groups, I get it. But if you're, you know, single, young, and healthy, and there's nobody else living in your house, and your neighbor is a nurse or a healthcare worker or a physician, and they need to go in, and you're able to without risking yourself, I think it'd be great if you helped them out. We're not asking people to take unnecessary risks. We're asking those that aren't going to incur a risk to themselves to help out those that are going to help us. I mean, it's a real problem if the dispatcher can't come to work because the dispatcher can't get daycare and the neighbor sitting next to her is otherwise not in a risk group. So that's all we're asking. Do you want to say my affiliation? Uh, Travis Breeze with KWWL. Um, what you were saying about medical supplies, are you imploring people to go like into their basements and see if they have excess medical supplies? No. What we're asking is if you're a business that normally would be doing, you know, dentistry or elective surgeries or something that you've closed down because of whatever reason, you know, you've uh, transferred your services. If you're in one of those healthcare industries, you probably now have supplies available because you're not seeing patients. So take those supplies and reach out to either your local emergency management agency, to the logistics folks, or to the healthcare industry in your community and say, hey, I've got a case of N95 masks. We're not seeing patients. Can you take these and use them? Same way with gloves, same way with gowns. What we're asking is for people that are affiliated to repurpose that equipment. Thank you. Yep. So um, any, you're saying to reach out to any healthcare providers or you or the hospitals to 
Correct. Okay. Find find the closest person to you. If you're, let me give you an example. If, to, to give the supplies to. Yeah. So if you want to donate those supplies for reuse because your place is not operating in business right now, then reach out to either your local hospital and tell them, hey, I've got some N95 masks, some gloves, whatever that I would like to donate. Or reach out to your local emergency operations center and say, hey, do you know of a hospital that needs this or a first responder group that needs this? Because it doesn't make a lot of sense if your business is closed and you're in the healthcare industry and you're not repurposing those things. Thanks, Hillary. Okay, I will step out. And I think you have Dave Coach with Johns County Public Health next. Thank you. As Dave Wilson mentioned, uh, Dave Coach, uh, Director of Public Health, will speak next. And again, um, if you have any questions for Dave after his statement, please ask those. Good afternoon. Last name again is spelled K-O-C-H, Director of Johnson County Public Health. With me this afternoon is Dr. Pete Wallace. He is the chair of our Board of Health in Johnson County. Before I uh, discuss the latest recommendations, I just want to take this opportunity to thank the people of Johnson County for your support, patience during this difficult time. I assure you that we are doing everything that we can to protect the health of the public. These decisions are based on the best information that we have at the time, and it changes frequently, as you know. Our governments, our school districts, our healthcare systems, nonprofit agencies are all working together to help minimize the spread of this virus. Many of these decisions are difficult to make, and they have impacts uh, on each of our lives in profound ways, and we realize that some of these are unintended consequences. For instance, when we close the schools, then we also have daycare and, and workforce uh, concerns. These decisions also affect vulnerable populations in Johnson County, so we were working with community partners to address those needs as well. There are some important points that I just must reiterate. You've heard these uh, numerous times before, but each of us can slow down the spread of this virus. We absolutely need to stay home if we're not feeling well. Uh, we also just need to wash our hands frequently, as you've heard many times over the last few days. Limit our interactions with others that are in the high-risk populations, those over 60, and those that have weakened immune systems. Here is what we know right now, as this is uh, evolving quickly. Um, as of Sunday, the Iowa Department of Public Health and Johnson County Public Health identified actually our county's first uh, positive COVID-19 case with no known expo exposure, suggesting that there is community spread in the county. This is indicative of community circulation of the virus, and this brings the total in Johnson County to 15 positive cases. The most common form of transmission is through respiratory droplets of someone who is sick, which means to become infected, people generally have to be within six feet of someone who is contagious and have the droplets land on them. This is why you're hearing the term social distancing and why staying home and limiting community movement is so important to slow the spread of this virus. Governor Reynolds issued a state of public health disaster emergency this morning, activating the public health response and recovering aspects of the state disaster emergency plan effective at noon today through April 16th of 2020. It takes significant steps to require social distancing and limit community spread of the virus by implementing temporary measures, including moving restaurants to drive through, carry out, and delivery only, and closures of certain entities such as bars, theaters, and recreational facilities. The proclamation also allows state agencies flexibility in responding to this unprecedented situation and supports the critical work of public health to mobilize as many public health response teams as are necessary. Anyone who believes that they may need to be tested for COVID-19 should call their health care provider first. Explain your symptoms and ask about testing, as not everyone who is sick needs testing. Do not show up unannounced at a lo local health facility, as that can also help spread the virus. Be assured that Johnson County Public Health is in constant contact with Iowa Department of Public Health and our local health care providers and we are dedicated to containing the spread of COVID-19 and mitigating its impact. 
So with that, I just want to, again, reiterate a few points here in the written statement that all of us can do um, our own part in helping to limit the spread of this by limiting our um, movement throughout the community. I know we all have to go to grocery stores. Um, it's also important to be mindful of other individuals. Um, there are reports of items disappearing on the shelves quickly. Um, so just be mindful and, and uh, considerate of others as well. So with that, I'll uh, open it up for any questions. Hi, I'm Erin Jordan with the Gazette. Um, so the this Gazette had reported about a DJ who had performed up in Cedar Rapids um, and has tested positive for COVID-19. His calendar list, um, a dozen or so, ten, at least 10 um, appearances in Johnson County as well. I wondered what um, you're doing here in the county to make people who might have been at those venues aware. That's a great question. Um, I'll try to repeat that question so everybody can hear that. Uh, the question was, there was a report of a uh, DJ that had uh, gone to several establishments while symptomatic and what we are doing um, in response to that. Is that accurate? Mm -hmm. Okay. So really, um, this individual um, is accurate that went to different establishments. Um, however, the risk to those individuals in the establishments is no higher than the risk to the general public right now due to the widespread um, community spread that we have in the county. And so we have reached out to those businesses. We have fielded numerous calls from individuals um, just to help assure them uh, what they can do. A lot of individuals, if they, if they are um, showing signs, to call their health care providers and walk through that. A lot of individuals, as stated, won't necessarily need to go in for a test. Um, but also, if individuals are able and they want to self-monitor, we're also spreading that message that if they were at one of these venues, that certainly to monitor their own symptoms. And if they exhibit any symptoms, flu-like illness, like symptoms to certainly not go to work and stay home and self uh, monitor. So that, that's, that's kind of our response to that particular situation. It would be similar in any other um, situations. This is just unique that the individual visited so many locations uh, with so many people involved. Um, Travis Breeze with KWWL. Um, what has the um, Johnson County Department of Public Health done as far as thinking about ways to change um, the ways that people pick up, you know, benefits to programs like WIC and stuff in Johnson County um, as far as maybe doing like uh, pickups in, instead of having them come into the office now? Can you talk about that? Absolutely. That's a great question, Travis. <clears throat> the question was, what are we doing locally at Johnson County Public Health to make sure that these benefits are distributed to our uh, vulnerable populations, oftentimes our WIC um, families? We have recently received guidance from the state WIC office um, with some guidelines on how to do that. We've also um, discussed internally, even today, with the recent announcements of how we can do that. So there, there are a number of ways that we are assuring that those benefits are getting out to the clients. Um, typically, a WIC uh, individual would meet with us three times a year, and a couple of those face-to-face -face meetings are not necessarily required to get their benefits. And so we're able to make sure that we can, we can even have a phone consultation and a phone call with that individual and just make sure that everything that we would do face-to-face -face, we can do over the phone with them. And then they have a card that has their benefits. We can load that card remotely. They do not even need to bring the card in. So there's, there's definitely ways that we are assuring that the individuals that we serve are still being served. Thank you. Hi, Hillary from the Iowa City Press Citizen. Can you describe uh, a little bit more in depth how someone who would have gone to one of the events with the DJ um, is at the same level of risk as someone from the general public? Okay, so the question is, if, if somebody was at one of those venues with the DJ, how can they be at the same level of risk as somebody in the general community? Yeah. Uh, fair, okay. 
So remember the mode of transmission. The mode of transmission is droplet. You have to be within six feet. I don't know exactly the setup in each one of those venues where the DJ was. Um, but again, the majority of those people likely never came within six feet of that individual. Um, and so that's why, that's why the level of risk, again, with a known individual that was symptomatic is going to be similar to anybody in the community that's in close contact with somebody else. And so that's, again, why we're stressing social distancing, why those numbers are continuing to be lowered. Uh, just today, now it's down to 10 people and we're really making additional strategies that you've seen to limit the contacts between people. Since, since the virus is in the community with community spread now, we have to take these steps and measures to ensure slowing down and flattening the curve that you've seen on TV or heard in reports, and that's exactly what we're trying to do. Uh, could you describe the um, the way, sorry, Hillary again, um, the way that uh, communication works between the public health department and the University of Iowa clinics and hospitals, or I guess any other hospital that might have a positive test result. Um, how that's communicated, and I guess then what the, how you make a decision to uh, relay that to the public. So the question is, how do we communicate between uh, the hospitals or state hygienic lab, how we relate to that to the community? So there, there is definitely a process. If an, an individual uh, was symptomatic and they call the health care provider, excuse me, uh, in that consult, if it was determined that a test would be ordered, that test would be, or that, that specimen would be collected, the test would be sent to state hygienic laboratories. They run those tests once a day, and those results are shared then with Iowa Department of Public Health. And then we get notification from Iowa Department of Public Health. Um, they do the risk assessment on that individual, and that risk asse assessment then determines if they're low or medium risk, and then that determines whether the order that IDPH uh, sends to them is uh, either isolation or quarantine. So the, the communication then back to the general public is basically the count on the website that IDPH has, has is updated Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We are putting in a system locally now that community spread is here, the testing numbers are going to go up. Um, we have to have a system that we can quickly notify the media and the public every day of any of the positive test results coming in. So we're working on that, we're talking about that. Um, it could be simply a news release, it could be on our website, it could be in multiple different ways, but we will make sure that those numbers are reported as quickly as we can. Currently, again, just to reiterate it, we're at 15 positive right now in Johnson County, as of right now. Okay, and sorry, and on similar lines, um, say someone who um, was at one of these events with the DJ um, starts to have symptoms um, and they're going to be tested. What is the communication like between, I guess, wherever that hospital is and the public health department if they haven't been tested yet, but they were at an event with the DJ, for example, or someone who did test positive and they have symptoms and how, how quickly can they get tested, basically, kind of the protocol there. So I'm not sure if I understand your question exactly, and it might be a question better for the hospitals. Yeah. Um, could you repeat that again? Because I'm, I'm just, I want to make sure that I understand. Yeah, I guess, so if someone was at a, one of these events with the DJ and uh, they start to have symptoms and they call their health care provider, mm -hmm. um, how soon would you be notified of that? And okay. what would that look like? Yeah, so, so in that conversation between the individual and their healthcare provider, that there, there's a, a criteria and a list that the healthcare providers um, have guidance on. And if they deem that they would want that individual to come in for a test, then that, that sample would be taken, it would be sent to a state hygienic laboratory. And again, it's that same process that if it was positive for COVID-19, then it gets reported to Iowa Department of Public Health, back to Johnson County Public Health, then our disease prevention specialists will initiate that, that investigation and surveillance. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, okay. sorry. I'm and thinking. you can follow up with the hospitals too okay. if, that, if that doesn't answer it directly. And then, um, 
why why wouldn't the public health department, for example, um, send out a message about someone that was at these events, um, even despite the you know the risk being the same for the general public versus people at these events? Why why wouldn't the public health department you know despite that send out a release saying that there is a positive result from someone who was at an event with hundreds of people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just just why not? Sure, sure. There's so there is some sensitivity that we've had historically from public health in releasing business names. Um, if we have a foodborne illness outbreak, for instance, we are not going to uh, release that business name for obvious reasons. And so we're very sensitive to that information. If individuals choose to release that information, that's outside of our control. Um, so that that's kind of. Uh, Again, we, we don't feel like the um, risk is any greater than right now to the general public. Just wanted to push back on that. I mean, I was looking at some of these events. They were, um, he does host karaoke, um, something called Name That Tune, a wedding. You know, I mean, people come up to the DJ and just like I'm talking into the mic, they would be doing that with karaoke, a mic that the DJ could have brought in, sure. touching like screens to pick the songs they want. I'm just... Are, are those things factoring into your decision at all? Decision to? To not, um, you know, put out any special advisories for those folks. Just saying that they're at the same risk level as anyone else in the community. Sure. Uh, we do take into consideration all those things. I mean, the, the, the physical setup of the, the location where that DJ is at, how many people perhaps could have come in contact. Um, I think it's pretty widespread. Um, we contacted all of those businesses directly, public health did, our staff did, um, just to notify them so that they were aware as well. Uh, there is no way that we would be able to contact potentially every single person in any of those venues to do that follow up. And again, we wouldn't necessarily recommend doing that um, just because of the position that we're in right now in the community. Do you talk about um, the potential for increasing the amount of testing um, that we could expect over the next few weeks? So the question is the potential for increased number of testing. And again, that question would be better posed to State Hygienic Laboratory or the hospitals. Um, certainly, there are more and more tests available than there were recently. Um, there, there's still some limitations on supplies for those test kits. Thank you all very much. Good afternoon. I'm Brandon Siggins, B-R-A-N-D-O-N-S-I-G-G-I-N-S. -I -I I'm the operations manager here at the Jack 911 Center. Um, as a 911 center in the county with positive cases, we know we're going to get several people calling in and asking us questions. Um, we ask that you please use 211 for any questions that you have related to COVID-19. Based on the information we have, 80% um, of the people with COVID-19 will recover best at home with mild symptoms. Calling 911, activating EMS, we feel that's unnecessary for anyone who simply thinks they have the virus. We ask in these situations you contact your local health care provider instead. Um, if you have the virus and you're having difficulty breathing, you're unable to get to uh, a car or around by yourself, uh, we appreciate or we feel it's appropriate to activate EMS at that time. If you do activate EMS, please be sure to identify on the phone and anyone that comes to your door. We're not telling people not to call 911. We're simply asking that you use it correctly. We're also currently screening callers with questions to be sure our responders are protected against this virus 
as well as others, including hospital staff. I'll answer any questions that you have. Have you been experiencing an increase in call volume? Can you just talk about the percentage of that over the last week or so? I think people are just scared and they're calling and they're wondering what to do. Um, today, a lot of the issues were people calling about their businesses being closed and calling to report their neighbor's business could be closed or should be closed. And they're reporting that they're remaining open. Would you be able to quantify, I mean, are, are you looking at like a 50% increase in calls, like just even roughly? I would say it's probably about 10 to 20% increase in calls. Any other questions? Hillary from the Press Citizen, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. Could you just repeat again uh, your title? Um, emergency Communications Coordinator, and I work for JECC Hi, everybody. I'm Margaret Reese, last name Reese, R-E-E-S-E, -E -E, with Mercy, Iowa City. I do have a few things to say about how things are at Mercy, Iowa City, and I'll try to answer uh, some questions as well. But I want you to know that I will speak on behalf of Mercy, and I will not make assumptions for anybody else. So um, we have further restrictions on visitors at Mercy, and we are now allowing one healthy adult per patient in the building at one time. Uh, two healthy adults per patient in the building at one time for pediatrics patients. We have limited our volunteer services uh, even further, and to that end, we have closed our 15-room guest lodging uh, for family members until further notice. Uh, and we are honoring the current guests we have, but we have canceled those who have reservations in the future and are not taking additional reservations at this time. We have also canceled daily mass. Um, we are conserving our resources as advised by our partner agencies such as Mississippi Valley uh, Blood Center whose capacity to supply blood has been diminished. Uh, and a reminder uh, that we always uh, point out that it's very, very important for individuals who feel they have symptoms to call ahead. If they believe they have symptoms or feel that they have been exposed, they must call ahead to their provider's office or to our Mercy on Call service to be screened. Uh, we encourage people to call Mercy on Call. It's a 24-7 nurse triage service, and it is experiencing a high volume of calls, as you may expect. So we ask people to please be patient and to leave a message, and someone will get back to them uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, today, we initiated our emergency operations plan and labor pool so that we are prepared for the future in case uh, we need more than we have going right now. Uh, in the last two days, we have constructed an outdoor tent-like uh, testing center outside of our emergency department to further separate those who are being tested for COVID-19 from the high volume of other patients we have who are needing care. And we have also tested patients in their cars. Uh, as long as they call ahead and we know to expect them, uh, we are able to do that. We have had two inpatients at Mercy with COVID-19. One has now gone home and the other should be going home soon. Uh, we are preparing for the worst and we are definitely hoping for the best. And if, we, if needed, we have the capacity to convert our largest nursing unit to a negative airflow unit uh, to care for patients and we're prepared to initiate that plan if necessary. Um, we strongly encourage social distancing. I'm sure the speakers before me also talked about this. Uh, it's being recommended by everyone. It's very, very important. So we ask people to please pay attention to that advice and follow all of the guidelines put out by IDPH and the CDC to thoroughly wash hands often, regularly disinfect surfaces, including our phones, practice social distancing, uh, and so on. So those are my prepared remarks for this afternoon. So just to clarify, you said that 
there were two patients um, that were you were treating for COVID-19 in the inpatient unit? Correct. Okay. And one has gone home and one should be going soon. Okay. And then a fo- another question. Um, you said that the Mississippi Valley Regional Blood Center was experiencing um, a shortage in blood donations? I'm, they are, you'll have to talk to them specifically, but what we're saying is that they do not have the capacity that they did prior to this to be able to supply, and they have let their partner agencies know uh, that it would be wise on our part to conserve the resources that we have. Uh, could you talk more? Sorry, Hillary from the Press Citizen. Hi, Hillary. Uh, could you talk more about when you started to offer testing and how many you've been able to, how many people you've been able to test on a daily basis? And and how quickly you get the results? Sorry. Well, Lots. we get the results back typically within 24 hours. They go to uh, the state hygienic lab um, for uh, the for them to be returned. We have been testing for um, about oh almost two weeks at this point, not quite two weeks. And it really, m- most of the patients that we have seen have, were on the cruise uh, to the Nile, uh, and they came in for testing uh, at Mercy. The uh, outdoor tent that you said had been constructed, uh, how big is that and what's the, the capacity? We um, are, uh, it, it's actually, it's kind of slick. Um, it is outside of our emergency room entrance. Uh, we're able to use the roof, uh, which uh, is the overhang outside of our emergency entrance and two of the walls. Uh, we have access to the, uh, to the emergency room that is not the public access. We also have access to the ambulance bay at that point. And so we have two walls of plastic. Uh, with doors uh, in there and also a, a wall in between so we can separate individuals being screened in there, keep them away from the inter- internal population in the emergency room. And then if they need to come in, they can go in this back way to get to an isolation room in the emergency room. So it, it's it, you'd have to go take a look at it. It was very creative, was conceived of yesterday, and it's done today, and we'll start testing in the next day or so using it or screening and testing. Was there a capacity to the amount of people that are at least expected to be coming through? You know, is it- no, we're just waiting to find out what happens. As you know, there have not been that many people who have been tested across the state at this time. And as I said, we are preparing for the worst and hoping for the best and hoping that all of the precautions that are being taken that have been announced by the governor and all the communities and so forth will help us to keep this rate of transmission down in the state of Iowa. That's what we're all hoping for. Hi, Margaret. Aaron hey, Jordan. With yeah, the hi, Aaron. Hey, um, I wanted to ask, too, with the governor's declaration today, um, does Mercy plan to increase bed capacity, or are you doing anything to, like, send other patients home maybe sooner um, in order to kind of free up beds? We're not doing that yet, but obviously everything is on the table to make sure we have capacity. And as I said, we have the ability to convert our largest inpatient unit uh, to a unit that would just take take care of patients if we need to do that. And we would be able to divert other patients who desperately need to be there to another area in the hospital. Um, sorry if you did say already a number, if you didn't have a number for how many people you've been able to test. I have that in my car because I didn't bring all my papers in with me. It's in the 30s that we have tested, but I can't and, tell you. And, and most have been um, either negative or uh, we have pending results. We we're, we're waiting for the results. Okay, and that started a couple Not quite weeks two ago. weeks ago. Oh, okay. And th- most of those are related to the crews. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to ask, too, about um, supplies, whether you are trying to get more like ventilators or the PPEs or what are you, how are you feeling about supplies? We feel reasonably good about supplies at this time. Um, we have been preparing for several months, knowing that this may be something that would happen. Uh, and uh, obviously, we're trying to keep a steady source of things coming in and we're being successful, although it takes longer now to get supplies than it did before. Uh, And um, we are conserving our resources. uh, So making sure people are using the appropriate PPE or personal protective equipment uh, for the appropriate procedures and not using things inappropriately that we might need later on. If someone, Sorry, I think it was uh, Dave Wilson mentioned that if local um, healthcare facilities that have extra supplies um, 
and can donate them if they wanted to reach out to you? Who should they contact if they wanted to donate masks or gloves or anything like that? If you're in need, I guess. I Well, I would... Um I mean, that could come through Johnson County Emergency Management, I imagine. And as because I'm here, I'll say myself for right now, and I could direct them to the right place. How would that be for a response? Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so that is the end of our prepared statements. I do want to note uh, both the University of Iowa Hospitals and Clinics and the university uh, were invited to participate today. But as you all know, because of the ever-changing situation, um, they had to shift some of their priorities today. But I have been asked to relay the message that um, you can reach out through their regular media relations channels, and they, they are prepared to um, answer any questions. Um, I also wanted to note that we do have um, Johnson County Board of Supervisors Chairperson Rod Sullivan here. He does not have a prepared statement, but he is available for questions if anybody uh, would be interested in asking any questions uh, of Rod. And I can pull him in if anybody is. For Rod? Okay, I will, I'll, I'll grab them real quick. Okay, yeah. Good evening, everybody. Hi. Hi, Rod. Um, I'm Sarah Watson with the Daily Iowan. Um, I was just wondering, uh, so today the Johnson County buildings announced that they were going to close down to the general public. I was wondering if um, if you guys had any plan for uh, when or if um, you'll direct county employees to work from home. Well, we already have uh, a start on as many people as we can right now working from home. Um, a lot depends on your job function. Some people will be starting that as early as tomorrow, but it, we're asking each department to uh, kind of come up with an individualized plan for their employees that'll depend upon what that person's job function is. Um, and then with public meetings, um, there's some to set, set to start next week, uh, public hearings and things. Do you have any um, kind of plans in place or like a timeline of when you're going to announce either cancellations or those of postponing or Zoom meetings, anything like that? There are actually, uh, there's actually some public hearings this Thursday. And we do intend to go on with those uh, as scheduled. Uh, we will uh, have something on our agendas that explains to folks how they can show up and uh, we will have somebody let them into the building so that they can make public comment and then they'll need to leave. Anything else from anybody? Thank you all. All right, well, uh, thank you all for coming today and thank you for sharing uh, information with the general public. Like I said, uh, if you do have any individual questions for any of the folks who participated today, just touch base with me once we've wrapped up and I can get them in contact with you.